Hey everyone, I'm Josh, Teen Services Librarian from the Billie Jean King Main Library. And I'm Julian, the Youth Services Supervisor also at the Billie Jean King Main Library. And welcome to the first episode of Readia, the Long Beach Public Library's monthly conversation that highlights new books from our teen collections, airing the third Wednesday of every month. For this month, we're going to be looking at Latinx authors and characters as part of our Vida Latina programming. All of these books and more are available for checkout from the Long Beach Public Library. All you have to do is go to our catalog, that's encore.lbpl.org, and search Readya 920, R-E-A-D-Y-A 920. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's jump right into it. Sounds good. So I'm gonna start with um, one I'm actually pretty excited about. It's uh, The New David Espinoza by Fred Aceves. So this is following up his highly regarded first novel, The Closest I've Come. And the second novel is an intense, but much needed take on a young man's struggle with body dysmorphia, steroid abuse, and toxic masculinity. After David becomes infamous for a viral video in which he gets beaten up, uh, he joins a gym and decides to bulk up in hopes of defending himself and impressing his friends. We soon see that David's social life is rapidly deteriorating, things are falling apart, uh, as he becomes consumed by this desire to seek out this ideal body. Uh, the new David Espinoza explores the silent epidemic that affects a lot of young men today, and it's something that I don't think is talked about enough. Um, and it's done uh, very carefully because Aceves uh, actually also suffered with body dysmorphia as a teen. Um, so really, really good, uh, timely novel. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I actually hadn't heard of that one. Um, I want to talk about one you might not have heard of because it didn't get as much buzz as I had hoped it would. Um, it's called Tigers Not Daughters by Samantha Mabry. And um, it's about the four Torres sisters and they dream of escape uh, from their smothering and tyrannical widowed father, from their San Antonio neighborhood full of old San Antonio families and from all of the traditions and expectations that go along with both. Um, the summer after their senior year, Anna, the oldest, plans to do just that, escape. But instead, she falls to her death from her bedroom window. A year later, her three younger sisters are still consumed by grief and haunted by their sister's memory. And their dreams of leaving Southtown now seem completely out of reach. But then strange things start happening around the house. Mysterious laughter, mysterious shadows, mysterious writing on the walls. The sisters begin to wonder if Anna's actually haunting them, trying to send them a message, and if so, what exactly she's trying to say. Uh, this book is deeply atmospheric, and it's been described as a ghostly Latina little women. So I'm pretty excited about this one. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the authors, since you know we're talking about uh, specifically about Latinx authors um, from all different uh, all different uh, areas of Latin America or the states with very different backgrounds. Samantha Mabry. Her name might not sound Latina, but she is, uh, was born and raised in Dallas and lives there still, teaching writing and Latinx literature at a community college. She recently tweeted for Latin American Heritage Month, you two are hashtag Latinx, even if you have a super white sounding last name like Mabry and a muy mal ability to speak Spanish. And if you don't find those books featuring people who share your background or experience, write those books. That's what I try to do. And Mabry has a couple of other books out, and I've tagged them in the catalog for everyone. That's great. It's always good to get a nice uh, wide um, perspective of, of what the Latinx experience is like. A lot of times what people think Latinx is is, uh, is really narrow, and um, it's really a wide spectrum of, of experiences. It is, and there's a huge amount of intersectionality in there. Uh, so for this next one, I'm going to take us to a galaxy far, far away uh, with Zoraida Cordova's Star Wars A Crash of Fate. So this is an expanded universe novel. Uh, it's part of the Galaxy's Edge series, which is uh, was made to promote the uh, Disneyland uh, park. <laughs> of course, you got to do it. Um, so it's sure to please all Star Wars fans looking for more. Uh, it stars Izzy and Jules, two friends living on the planet Bantu. It's their idyllic childhood home, but it comes all to a crashing halt when Izzy's parents are found dead. Um, so that kind of sets off a bunch of uh, chain of events that causes Izzy to move off world and become a smuggler. 
So years later, when they're both teens, they have a chance encounter back on planet Bantu, and they find themselves joining forces looking to overcome their pasts and uncover these secrets that they've kept from each other um, and decide to go on the run. This book is a super fun mix of romance, adventure, sci-fi, and these swashbuckling adventures that you've come to expect from a Star Wars story. That sounds really interesting. I'm actually a Star Wars fan myself, so I'll have to check that out. <laughs> nice. So funny enough, I also have um, some Zoraida Cordova to talk to you about. I brought today um, her Brooklyn Bruja series, which starts with Labyrinth Lost. Um, and this series is not your standard urban fantasy. There are no elves, fairies, vampires, or other usual suspects. Instead, we're drawn into a world of African, Caribbean, and Mexican mysticism. Um, Alejandra, Alex, is a young bruja or witch from a big family of brujas and brujos. She's just about to come of age with the celebration of her death day, which is kind of like a quinceañera, which will activate her powers and allow her to control them. But Alex's biggest secret is that she already has her powers and she doesn't want them. So she decides that instead of embracing her powers, she'll do a spell to banish them. And guess what happens? Instead, she banishes her entire family into a different dimension. Now her family is in danger of being devoured, and that is with a capital D. And Alex will have to rescue them with the help of Nova, a boy she doesn't know or trust. The second book, Bruja Born, uh, which focuses on Lula, one of Alex's sisters, is also in our collection. And the final book, Wayward Witch, about Alex's other sister, Rosa, should be in sometime next month. Uh, Zoraida Cordova was actually born in Guayaquil, Ecuador, and moved to the States as a young girl. She identifies as Latina and is one of the co-founders of the Latinx and Kidlet blog, which is a website centering fellow Latinx authors. She wrote, are you ready for this? She wrote her debut novel, The Vicious Deep, as part of NaNoWriMo in 2010, when she was only 23, and it was bought by a publisher within a week of submission. So I've tagged all of Zoraida's books in our catalog, including the Vicious Deep series, which we don't have in print, but we do have in ebook format. Yeah, you gotta use those ebooks and audiobooks too. I've tagged a few. Others. Absolutely. And actually, I should mention that um, most of what we're talking about here today is in multiple formats in our catalog. Um, so my next one, we're going to go on the go on the road, so to speak, with uh, Patrick Flores Scott's American Road Trip. This centers around Teodoro Avila and his family during the Great Recession back in 2008. So after his older brother Manny returns from serving in Iraq, Teodoro, Manny, and their sister Zochitl uh, set out for a road trip. This is a humorous and often heart-wrenching story that follows the Avila siblings as they make their way down the West Coast and into New Mexico. And they're hoping to find a sort of catharsis for Manny, but also bring the family back together because they've been separated for so long. Uh, it's a remarkable coming of age story that looks at mental illness, socioeconomic pressures, and the challenges that come with growing up. It's, um, it's, it's poignant and, and really nice, well-written. I, I really enjoyed it. So I actually listened to it in audio, speaking of which uh, we don't have it on audio, but um, I just want to plug that it's like a really great format. Um, it's also a valid way to consume your books. So I always try to put that out there when I can. Absolutely. And it allows you to multitask in a way that uh, holding a book doesn't necessarily do. I've tried. I've tried reading and doing other things at the same time. It doesn't work out so well. So I'm going to jump on your theme of family and journeys and separation uh, and talk to you about Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. Uh, this novel in free verse tells the story of two sisters who don't know that the other exists until their lives are forever changed by a plane crash. Camino lives in the Dominican Republic and can't wait for the day when her father, her puppy, arrives for his summer visit from New York. But when she gets to the airport to greet him, she finds instead a building full of grieving people. Yahaila is in the middle of a typical day at school in New York when she's called to the principal's office and met there by her mother, who tells her that her father, her hero, has died en route to his annual business trip. Each girl must not live in a world without her father, and nothing will ever be the same. And then their father's secrets are brought to light, the fact that he has two families, and the sisters find that there's someone who shares their grief in a way that no one else can. 
Um, Elizabeth Acevedo, uh, who is Dominican American and identifies as Afro Latina, we were talking about there being no one way to be Latinx, um, started writing poetry when she was 12 moved on to spoken word or slam poetry in her teens and actually was a national poetry slam champion. The great thing about her novels is they're written in both poetry and prose, which is really lovely. Uh, we've got a couple of other cop, uh, titles by her that I've read, uh, The Poet X and With the Fire on High, which of course I've tagged in the catalog. I loved The Poet X and I'm really excited to read that one, so looking forward to it. I'm um, going to continue this theme of, of dead parents because um, we would have been, uh, uh, we would be without so many great stories without uh, dead parents. <laughs> Such a great trope. Um, so we've got Teen Titans Raven by Kami Garcia and Gabrielle Piccolo. So it's a more grounded take on the traditional superhero story that some of us might be a little tired of. I know I am, but I really enjoyed this. So I feel like if I can advocate for it, then it must be a pretty strong uh, uh, graphic novel. So it's written by Kami Garcia, as I mentioned, who you might know as the co-author of the Beautiful Creatures series, and an up-and-coming Brazilian artist by the name of Gabriel Piccolo. So Teen Titans Raven introduces Rachel Roth, who is our uh, main character, and um, she is involved in a car accident, and it gives her amnesia and also kills her adoptive mother. And so at which point she has to move to New Orleans, and um, move back in with her, her adoptive mother's sister. And in the, in the meantime, kind of put together the pieces of her life. Um, on top of all this, she has to deal with a new school, these, these powers that seem to be manifesting, and of course, what uh, high school experience is uh, without demons, both real and imagined. So Raven has to decide if she's ready to face what's buried in her past and the darkness that is building inside of her. And also be on the lookout for the follow-up, which is going to be focusing on Beast Boy coming this fall, um, also by the same uh, writing pair. So keep an eye out for it. We should have it probably in the upcoming months. Awesome. We will have it in the upcoming months. I saw the order go through. So uh, I don't think there are any dead parents in my next books. Uh, so I guess I'm going to do a little bit of a 180 because there's no superpowers necessarily. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about a dystopian duology uh, by Taylor K. Mejia, starting with We Set the Dark on Fire. And um, in Medio, upper class girls are trained for one of two roles in their polarized society. They either get to run a husband's household or they get to raise his children. And both of these roles are promised a life of comfort and luxury uh, because everything's kind of a political mess with lots of uprisings from the lower class outside of that world. Danny is the top student in her class, but her future depends on nobody learning her darkest secret, right? There's always a secret. Uh, her pedigree is a lie. Her parents sacrificed everything to get forged documents so she could rise above her station. And now she's about to marry the son of an important family, so she has to keep the truth hidden or be sent back to the fringes of society where famine and poverty are, are the everyday reality. On her graduation night, though, nothing can prepare Danny for the choices she must make as events unfold, especially when she asked, is asked to spy for a resistance group desperately fighting to bring equality to Medio. Can she give up everything that she's worked so hard for and ignore this massive sacrifice that her parents have made uh, in order to achieve freedom for all of Medio, and maybe even to have a chance at a forbidden love. These questions are more answered in this book and in the sequel, which is We Unleash the Merciless Storm. Taylor is biracial Mexican-American, born and raised in Oregon, where she still lives. And she feels really passionate about the representation of Latinx in the media and the oppression the community faces. She says that she wrote this duology as a love letter to queer Latin uh, let me try that again, to queer Latina girls who refuse to allow the world to box them in. We get so used to saying Latinx that when it's gendered, my tongue gets a little tied. I apologize. Um, Taylor hasn't written any other books right now that are in the young adult collection, although she's in a couple of short story collections, uh, but she does have a middle grade out. Um, and of course I didn't write the name down, but it's about a girl uh, dealing with La Llorona. So that one looks pretty exciting. It's part of the uh, Rick Riordan Presents imprint, uh, which is 
actually centering a lot of uh, BIPOC protagonists. So I really like where he's going with that. Yeah, really like that it's exploring that like wider mythology because I think when people mm-hmm. think of mythology, they think of Western canon mythology, which I find very much boring. <laughs> So the next book I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to go back to graphic novels and talk about Photographic, The Life of Graciela Iturbide. It's written by Isabel Quintero, and the art is by Zeke Pina. So you might recognize Isabel uh, from her uh, previous kind of more famous novel, uh, Gabby, A Girl in Pieces. Um, this one is more biographical and grounded, and it's uh, tracing the life and work of a Mexican photographer. So after a fateful turn of events, uh, this young woman turns to photography as an outlet for her pain. This beautiful narrative weaves Iturbide's journey across Mexico and eventually the world as she becomes a a world-renowned photographer. Um, It mixes uh, real images of of her photography in, in in the comic next to Pena's bold black and white art and Quintero's beautiful prose. It's it's a really, really great book. I really enjoyed it. I like I like narrative nonfiction. I also like graphic novels. So I think the mixture of the two is is really well done. And it I love hearing stories about uh, individuals from the past that you aren't necessarily told about in history class. So this is just my bread and butter. It's a great, it's a great novel. Great. Thank you for sharing that with me. I definitely hadn't heard of that one. Um, I want to talk to you next about Dear Haiti, Love Elaine, which is basically a love letter to Haiti, um, written by Maika and Maritza Mulit. Um, so many people have a really um, singular image of Haiti in their mind, uh, and Haiti is so much more than what we think of it as, and that's discovered by our protagonist in Dear Haiti, Love Elaine. Uh, After an incident at school involving her Latin American history project and a desire to send her gossipy classmates a message, Elaine is shipped off to Haiti where she's expected to learn more about the history and traditions of her native land. As she uncovers things about her mother and the curse her family is said to have, Elaine goes on a fantastical quest to help herself and to save all of her family. This novel is relayed through letters and journal entries, which is one of my favorite ways to read a novel. Um, And it balances the sometimes gritty reality of life in Haiti with Elaine's casual wit and sarcasm to present a new, sorry, to present a nuanced view of the island nation from the perspective of someone who's both an outsider and also has deep connections to the people and the culture. The Afro-Latina Mulit sisters, who are two of a family of four daughters, are Miami natives whose parents are Haitian immigrants. They work together to create a story that at its heart is about a girl getting to know her mother, her culture, herself, but also to make it clear that black girls can go on hilarious, crazy, life-changing adventures too, which I really appreciate. Uh, Dear Haiti, which was the Mulit sisters' first novel, came out last year, and their second book, One of the Good Ones, should be out early next year, hopefully. Sounds really cool. Um, I th- and I think we've talked about this before, but it's, that's a really nice book cover. Um, um, we, we, I think we both agree that it's okay to judge books by their covers. Um, Absolutely. That's a really, really, I was gonna say it's a beautiful cover. Okay, so for my last book, I'm talking about We Are Not From Here by Jenny Torres Sanchez. And so it focuses on La Bestia, which uh, if you're not familiar with, it's this expanse of train track that migrants uh, moving north from Central America have to face. Um, It's a violent sort of grisly uh, stretch where um, migrants are faced with with violence from other people. Um, They're often horribly uh, disfigured and dismembered by kind of jumping from train to train. Uh, It's a really brutal expanse. So We Are Not From Here focuses on three teens, three Guatemalan teens as they traverse this treacherous passage and it it unflinchingly depicts this brutal but unforgiving journey that they're facing as they set out for the southern U.S. border. Torres Sanchez balances these moments of danger and violence with a persistent feeling of hope and resilience in a realistic depiction of those who are forced to leave their home seeking safety and opportunity. Another one I hadn't heard of. You did a great job in, in pulling some books that were, I think, kind of off the beaten path. And I think that our patrons are really going to appreciate that. 
I'm going to turn a total 180 from where we just were um, and talk about a fairy tale adaptation, actually, um, called Dark and Deepest Red. Let me hold it so that you can see the title. Dark and Deepest Red by Anna Marie Macklemore. Um, in the summer of 1518, there's a strange sickness that sweeps through Strasbourg. And I forgot to mention, this is a dual timeline book, so it doesn't just set in the past. Um, so the strange sickness is sweeping through Strasbourg. Women are dancing in the streets, some until they fall down dead. And of course, as it was back in 1518, rumors of witchcraft spread. Um, and suspicion turns towards Lavinia and her family. And Lavinia may have to do the unimaginable to save herself and everyone that she loves. Five centuries later, so if you do the math, that basically puts us around 2018 or 2020 right now. Uh, five centuries later, Rosella puts on a pair of red shoes and they make her dance uncontrollably and won't come off. She's drawn to a boy who knows the dancing fever's history better than anyone, Emil, whose family was actually blamed for the fever hundreds of years ago. But there's more to what happened in 1518 than even Emil knows, and discovering the truth may decide whether Rosella survives the red shoes or not. So, Anna Marie, Anna Marie McElmore, the author, uh, their official bio says they were born in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains and taught by their family to hear La Llorona in the Santa Ana winds. At the time they began writing Deep and Darkest Red, they identified as a queer Latinx woman, but writing the story turned out to actually be a journey of further personal discovery for them. They say, I wrote this book not realizing that I was non-binary, and now they use the personal pronouns they and them, and their husband is trans. Macklemore is actually really known for crafting um, stories filled with magical realism and fairy tale themes. She's got several others, and of course you can find them tagged in our catalog. I think that kind of wraps us up for stories. Yeah, that was all of mine. That was also all of mine. Um, we only had a limited amount of time today to talk, uh, so we couldn't hit all of the authors that we might have wanted to, but there are several others, uh, Daniel Jose Older, Lilian Rivera, Benjamin Aliere Sainz, Erica L. Sanchez, Adam Silvera, Francisco X. Stork, and then many more than that, but we're going to go ahead and at least tag books by those six in the catalog, as well as the other books by these authors that we talked to you about today. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, everybody, um, for the first episode of Readia. So remember, uh, check us out every third Wednesday of the month. Stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you next month. And don't forget the tag. See you. <laughs>